Now we're going to talk about the French Revolution. So the American Revolution took place from 1775 to 1783. As you see on the map there, the French Revolution began just six years after the American Revolution ended. And in a lot of ways, the French Revolution was inspired by the American Revolution. So how did the American Revolution lead to the French one? In the 1780s, the French people uh, were very inspired by what the American Revolution was able to accomplish. And the French people wanted for themselves a revolution of their own. They wanted to, uh, like the Americans did, they wanted to replace their authoritarian monarchy and have a freer society like the United States was able to become. But the French Revolution ended up being much, much different from the American Revolution. The American Revolution was a good thing. It really was a good thing. It's seen almost universally as such. Um, one of the greatest nations in the history of the world was formed as a result of it, and it's seen pretty much universally as a good thing. However, the French Revolution was just a, a bloody, chaotic mess that really, in the end, accomplished nothing. Because in the end, the French overthrew their authoritarian monarchy, but then they replaced it with another authoritarian monarchy and they didn't really have anything to show for it except for hundreds of thousands of deaths. Uh, so the French Revolution was very unproductive. However, the ideas that the French Revolution brought about really changed human history, and that's why it's so significant. So in order to understand the French Revolution, you gotta talk about what France was like in the 18th century. Well, in the 1700s, France was a very wealthy, stable society, it's just coming off the heels of King Louis XIV, the Sun King. Uh, but its tax structure was very problematic. As you see in that political cartoon, you have the king and you have the nobility on the backs of the peasants, kind of, kind of crushing the backs of the peasants. And that really shows how the peasants were taxed very, very heavily, huge burden on them. Not only were the, the peasants taxed heavily, but only the peasants in the middle class were taxed at all. While the nobility and the clergy, the upper classes, paid no taxes whatsoever. And We've learned about several nations in history who fell because of this, who caused revolutions to happen by taxing their peasants far too heavily. We talked about China, we talked about the Ottoman Empire, others, and this is an example of France not really learning the lessons of history. So um, this is one of the many things that led to the revolution. And then there was an economic downturn in France in the 1780s caused by a number of different things. So France became very deeply in debt because of their aid to the American colonists during the American Revolution. They helped us out at great cost to them, and it kind of came back to haunt them uh, financially. So King Louis the Sixteenth started to spend half of France's federal budget to pay off the national debt. And his attempted financial reforms just did not work, and this caused France to have to declare bankruptcy by the end of the 1780s. At the same time, as if things couldn't get any worse, there were a ton of hailstorms that just pelted France and damaged the food supply, and this led to widespread hunger. So by 1789, the French peasants were to the point of rebellion. A very simple equation here, okay? High taxes plus widespread hunger equals angry peasants. Uh, they were suffering tremendously. They didn't have enough food to eat, did not have enough money to buy food because they were taxed so heavily, so they were to the point of rebellion. And meanwhile, King Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Marie Antoinette, they were dining well. They were living in the luxurious palace of Versailles. And the nobles really weren't suffering either. It was only the peasants who were 97% of the population. And this made a lot of peasants want to rebel. So in response to this crisis, Louis the Sixteenth called a meeting of the Estates General. And this is something we've talked about before. And at this point, the Estates General had not met in France for over a century. And this group was made up of representatives from all three estates, being the third, remember the uh, third estate being the peasants. So you'd think that this would be a good thing, you know, they'd come to a consensus because you have all different interests being represented here, but they really couldn't agree on anything. Uh, the things that the peasants wanted were different from the things that the nobility wanted, etc. cetera. Uh, so the representatives of the third estate, the peasants, they just left the meeting in frustration, and they said, you know what, we're going to start our own legislative body, the National Assembly. So they left, and uh, Louis XVI decided to be real petty about it, 
and locked them out of the building. He said, how dare they walk out on their king? We're going to lock them out of the building. So that's exactly what he did. And this caused the peasants to meet at an indoor tennis court. And here they swore what's called the tennis court oath. A little hint, you will have an excerpt from the tennis court oath on your test. So definitely pay attention here. The tennis court oath is when the National Assembly, this group of peasants who walked out of the Estates General, they swore this oath that they would create a French constitution even if it killed them. Okay, So they said, we will stop at nothing, we will not rest until we gain the rights and freedoms that the Americans have. And that was the tennis court oath. So the event that officially started the French Revolution was the storming of the Bastille. The Bastille was a huge prison in Paris. And it was seen kind of like as a symbol of the tyranny of the absolutist monarch. Um, there was uh, torture of criminals that uh, went in there, incarceration of peasants, and there were a lot of uprisings all around Paris at this time because of the food shortages. People were hungry and they rioted in the streets of Paris. So Louis XVI, instead of trying to help them and giving them food uh, or job opportunities, he sent troops into Paris to break up these riots. And the people kind of saw this as a big betrayal. They saw this really as an act of war, saying, we're the ones hungry, we need food, and you send the military uh, to, to calm us down. Uh, and so they responded by invading the Bastille prison on July 14th, 1789. And this is known uh, still in France today as Bastille, Bastille Day. They actually celebrate this every year. And this was done both to free peasant prisoners and also to acquire guns and ammunition from the storehouses in the Bastille, and that is exactly what they did. Then on August 26, 1789, the National Assembly published a document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man. They said this is the uh, realization of the Tennis Court Oath. We made this oath to, uh, to acquire these rights and freedoms like the Americans have, and now this is us keeping our promise. So they... Um, established this document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and this proclaimed that everyone had certain natural rights. You've heard that before, John Locke, Declaration of Independence. Um, and it made the securing of those rights an integral part of the new Constitution. At first they called it life, liberty, and security. Uh, eventually it became liberty, equality, and fraternity. But the Declaration of the Rights of Man uh, were really the, the highlight, the, the, the peak of the French Revolution. Um, one of the only good things to come about uh, from it. And you also, a little hint, you also will have an excerpt from the Declaration of the Rights of Man on your next test. Now, when this began, people expected um, France to uh, change into a constitutional monarchy. That's what they thought was going to be the result of the French Revolution because there had been things like this before in Europe. Remember the enlightened despots? They kind of created these constitutional monarchies, gave their people some rights, and retained some power for themselves. Uh, so this would mean that Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette would still be king and queen of France, uh, <clears throat> but there would be a parliament, kind of like Congress, as well as them. All right, And that is what people expected. But then it didn't turn out that way, because in October of 1789, a rumor was started. Okay, this is why you don't start rumors, kids. A rumor was started that Marie Antoinette was hoarding grain somewhere inside the palace of Versailles. And this rumor resulted in the Women's March. And this was a violent protest in which this large group of angry peasant women, uh, led by a group of uh, merchant women called the Fish Ladies because they worked in the fish market, uh, they stormed the palace and they demanded that Louis and Marie be kicked out and moved to Paris. They say uh, they said you uh, should not be able to live in the lap of luxury while we are starving. So they um, stormed the palace of Versailles, killed dozens of their guards, and um, the king and queen thought they would be killed too. But then they took them prisoner to Paris. Now, a group of people that were uh, very destructive during the French Revolution were the Jacobins. So the Jacobins were the most radical, violent, extremist wing of the revolutionaries, and they called for a republic instead of just a constitutional monarchy, which would remove the king entirely. And these Jacobins held a protest march, and they were actually fired upon by troops of the National Assembly. Now. Now, carefully listen to that. These are not troops of the king 
Okay, these are troops of the National Assembly, the other peasants, okay, the third estate that established the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Tennis Court Oath. They were the ones firing upon the Jacobins, and 50 of them were killed. And this is a, a, a really big reason why the French Revolution was not successful like the American Revolution was, and that's because the American Revolution was united, whereas the French Revolution really wasn't. It was very fragmented. You had all these different groups that wanted all these different things, and... Uh, here you have one group attacking and killing another group, okay? And that's really how this entire revolution uh, went about. So in 1791, the assembly uh, completed a new constitution, which Louis kind of had to approve since he was kind of a prisoner of Paris at that point. So this created a limited constitutional monarchy. It stripped the king of a lot of his authority, but he still kept his title of king, and it created what was called the Legislative Assembly, and this replaced the National Assembly. And the Legislative Assembly, very similar to our Congress or Britain's Parliament, had the right to make laws and declare war. But this new French government was seen as a failure because despite having a new government, you, have, you still have all these old problems like food shortages and debt. Uh, they didn't go away just with this new government. So the Legislative Assembly really disagreed on how to fix these problems. There were all these different options. They couldn't agree on what to do. They said, should we keep this limited monarchy? Should we remove the king entirely, establish a republic? Or should we just undo the revolution, say it was a mess, and restore the absolute monarchy? They could not decide on anything. And this confusion and division caused even more violence to erupt on the streets of Paris. So the French Revolution is just this big cycle that keeps going around and around and around. First, you have riots in the streets of Paris because of hunger or because of debt or taxes or whatever. Then after those riots, as a result, you have the establishment of a new government, a new constitution. Then that government fails, and then there are more riots in the streets of Paris, followed by a new government being established, that government fails, then more riots in the streets of Paris. We'll see this wheel turn five or six times throughout the French Revolution. Then in 1792, an event that added to this chaos, as if things weren't bad enough in France as it was, the Prussians and the Austrians invaded France. They saw their opportunity. They said France is weak now. Their king is basically a prisoner, a shell of what he used to be. And now is our chance to attack France. So they invaded. They ultimately failed um, because the the French just had so many people, they were able to repel the Austrian and Prussian attacks. However, Louis XVI actually encouraged the Prussians and the Austrians. He was mailing them letters, um, encouraging them to invade, telling them uh, you know, secret strategies and things, ways to overtake the government, because he was hoping that when the Austrians and Prussians overtook the, the legislative assembly, that he, Louis, would be... Uh, returned to his absolute throne as the king of France. And this that's treason, okay? That's, that's treason, literally trying to um, thwart the success of your nation at war. And the French people, when they found out about this, they saw this as abandonment and treason. So what happened in response to pressure from restless peasants in the streets, okay, you had more riots in the streets of Paris. So the legislative assembly was dissolved, the king was deposed, and the monarchy was replaced with a republic. And then the people who took control of that government were the worst ones of all, the Jacobins, the most extremist, violent, radical wing of the revolution. So they took control of the National Convention. That was the new governing body. And they called for the death of all those people who continued to support King Louis the Sixteenth. And then King Louis XVI was imprisoned for his support of the Prussians during the war. He was put on trial, found guilty, and sentenced to die via guillotine. The guillotine is this instrument of execution you see on the screen there. Uh, this, it was this new method of execution, and it was advertised as very humane and egalitarian. Not sure if there is a humane way to kill someone, but um, they said it's relatively painless. Everyone dies the same way unlike how it used to be where the royalty got painless death and the peasants got painful deaths, um, this was more fair, they said. This was more equal. So King Louis, King of France, was beheaded by his own people. He was killed on January 21st, 1793. And here's a picture of when that happened. Okay, They beheaded him and they held up his head, his severed head, to the crowd. Pretty barbaric, pretty brutal. 
but that was the French Revolution. Now, the enemies of the Jacobins were pretty much everyone who wasn't a Jacobin. Now, every country in Europe was just appalled by the Jacobins' radical actions and ideas. Uh, you even have most French peasants were just horrified by the execution of their king. They're like, yeah, we didn't really like the king. We didn't like what he was doing. Okay, we wanted a change, but we didn't want him to be slaughtered. I mean, that was just horrifying to people who saw the king as divinely appointed by God. Remember the divine right of kings. So French peasants were just horrified by the, by the execution of their king. And you had a lot of French priests uh, who would not accept the government's secular control because the Jacobins were very anti-religion. And there were a lot of people within France who wanted to take the French government away from the Jacobins. And then came this guy, Maximilien Robespierre, one of the coolest names in history, one of the worst people in history. He was a Jacobin, and he gained power in 1793 as the leader of the Committee of Public Safety. Called this because it did nothing to ensure the safety of the Republic. And he set out to build what he called a Republic of Virtue by wiping out every trace of France's past, including all religion. He said all French traditions, all French, uh, all religion in general, we need to do away with it because it did not work for us. Everything needs to be completely new. So he actually changed the calendar. He said, this is no longer 1793, this is now the year one, and he changed all of the months. He changed uh, the weeks to be 10 days long instead of seven days, and he removed all Sundays in doing that because Sunday was a religious day. Uh, he closed all churches in France, made all religion illegal. He renamed the streets in Paris, uh, streets that were named after saints. Uh, he replaced all that because he wanted to do away with Christianity all together. And for a year, Robespierre governed France as basically a dictator, and his rule was known as the Reign of Terror. Now, his goal during the Reign of Terror was to find what he called enemies of the revolution and have them executed via guillotine. And in 1793 and 1794, thousands of people who had actually led the revolution at the beginning received death sentences simply because they were not as radical as Robespierre. You had people who actually stormed the Bastille back in 1789. You had people who were there at the beginning who were revolutionaries themselves. And Robespierre said, nope, you're not as radical as me. You didn't support the execution of the king. You're going to get your head chopped off too. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, so on October 16th, 1793, the Queen of England, uh, sorry, the, the, the Queen of France was also guillotined. All right, so you have... Uh, King Louis dying in January of 93, and then a few months later in October of 1793, Marie Antoinette was killed by the guillotine as well. Uh, in addition to the former king and queen of France being killed, about 40,000 people were executed during the terror by the guillotine. And what was crazy, aside from the sheer number of, this, uh, of, the, of these people who were killed, is that 85% of them were peasants. Or middle class. And that's those are the people for whom the revolution had begun in the first place. I mean, that was the whole point of the revolution was to help the peasants and the middle class who were being oppressed by the wealthy. And 85% of the people killed by the guillotine during the terror were those very people, the peasants and the middle class. So like I said, the French Revolution really did not accomplish anything at all. Here's a picture of Marie Antoinette uh, right before she was put to death. Then in July of 1794, after Robespierre had um, executed over 40,000 people, he had begun to turn on his own people. Okay, uh, his, uh, One of his friends named George Danton, okay, who was a Jacobin too, he was a radical too, Robespierre said, nope, his head's coming off too, just because he could. And so people began to be very afraid. Um, even those who were close to Robespierre were afraid that he might turn on them and kill them like he did to Danton and others. So what they did, uh, fearing their own safety, Robespierre's supporters turned on him. They said, that's the only way we can literally save our own necks. So Robespierre was arrested, and then he himself was executed by the same guillotine that he had used to kill 40,000 people. Very ironic and, uh, and really justified turn of events. So at the end of the Reign of Terror, people took a deep breath and said, whoa, what has just happened here? Okay, they marveled at the past five years of chaos and bloodshed and said, all right, what has happened here? What can be done to restore order and peace? 
to France. So a new constitution was established, yes, another one, and this placed power in the hands of the middle class, something they had not tried before. So this new government had a two-house legislator and an executive body, kind of like the United States did. Remember, the whole purpose of the French Revolution was to try to become like America. And this executive body had five men called the Directory. These men were moderates, they weren't radicals, they weren't monarchists, they were right down the middle and seemed like the right men for the job. And this actually gave the troubled country of France a brief period of rest, of, of safety and order and peace after this tumultuous reign of terror. Now the Directory found this very talented young man to lead France's army in the years following the reign of terror, and his name was Napoleon Bonaparte. You've probably heard that name before. And through this man's military skill and leadership, France ended up winning their wars with Prussia, Austria, and Britain, and restoring order to France once again. So Napoleon, understandably, became wildly popular with the French people. So much so that by 1799, uh, there was a coup d'etat, a takeover, in which the enormously popular uh, Napoleon Bonaparte overthrew the Directory, the people who had actually appointed him in the first place to power. He overthrew the Directory, and he was established by the French people as the first consul of France. Yes, another constitution was established here. So many different constitutions, so many governments, so many riots, just a big cycle that went around and around. That's what the French Revolution was. So he was granted unlimited power under yet another constitution, and Napoleon, when he took power, proclaimed the revolution to be over. Napoleon would later crown himself Emperor of France, which we'll talk about next class, and he would become an authoritarian monarch, very much like King Louis XVI had been, um, which is why the French Revolution was fought in the, in the first place, to get rid of that kind of government. Okay, so the changes that the French government went through during the revolution, France went from having an absolute monarchy to then a republic, to the reign of terror with an authoritarian dictator that killed tens of thousands of people, to another republic, and then essentially to another monarchy with Napoleon as the emperor, okay? So really nothing changed, okay? This, it, it just went full circle. And that's the big difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution is that the French Revolution went full circle, whereas ours didn't. Okay, the French Revolution went from monarchy to republic and then all the way back to monarchy again. Whereas the American Revolution went from monarchy to republic and we have stayed a republic for 250 years. So this decade of chaos, summing, all, summing it all up, this decade of chaos known as the French Revolution killed over 100,000 people, most of them peasants. And what did it accomplish? In the end, it accomplished nothing. Okay, nothing for the French people since they just traded one monarchy for another with nothing but hundreds of thousands of dead bodies to show for it. Um, however, these ideas that drove the French Revolution, these ideas of equality, secularism, individual freedoms, uh, the whole concept that violence can be justified, um, these would all have a huge impact on the world for centuries to come, as we'll see with the rest of our uh, unit. Okay, So let me know if you have any questions about the French Revolution.